hit into the focus areas and, and, and as they go through these, Matt hit some of these points, but I just want to emphasize them again, because based on a lot of the comments that came through, I think there still might be some confusion about the, the plans that we're developing. So we're using specific locations as examples. Um, however, the concepts we're showing, they could apply in different areas that are similar to these. So even though we're showing village centers, we're showing Owen Brown, some of those concepts can apply in other village centers as well, but obviously not the exact same way. Um, the concepts do not represent specific proposals for this locations we're showing. Uh, they represent a possible solution, but not the solution. Obviously, there's a lot of things that have to happen before the real solution happens. Next. Um, the other thing is, and Matt uh, hit this with the tulip slides, that you know the general plan sets in motion the policies, um, and then those zoning regulations that happen at a later date make these policies happen. Um, it's also important to note that mar the market forces and private interests play a role in whether what's allowed gets built. So the the general plan and the ordinances may allow something, but you know if the market or private interests don't you know build it. Um, it's not going to just happen on its own. So that's important to keep in mind. And then the last note. Um, so, you know, it's important to stress that the county values the, the older and existing businesses and the older established communities. This, uh, these concepts we're showing does not do not imply that all older areas must redevelop. It's rather we're showing recommended approaches should redevelopment occur. Uh, so it's not uh, mandating that redevelopment occurs, but should it happen, these are concepts to show that. Next. <laughs> and before we get into the specifics, uh, this kind of simplified concept diagram, it really highlights some of the, the principles that we're applying to all of the, the concepts that we'll be showing uh, tonight. Um, you know, starting with Columbia's natural open space network, which really defines the community and uh, everyone holds value a value to the, the natural stream corridor, the wooded wooded corridors, and the pathway and trail network. Add into that the Columbia's parkways, which are also heavily valued and characteristic of the community, and the heavily landscaped streets that define the character. Um, and then add in so those are existing elements of the community form. Then there's a lot of interest of the interconnected public realm that. Uh, Places are better connected, village centers are better connected, neighborhoods are better connected to open space. When we put all that together, it, it kind of illustrates the opportunities we have of creating some walkable development areas that are respectful of the community character. For example, the, the gray area below in there is maybe an existing neighborhood in Columbia, but then the two areas above showing how redevelopment could occur uh, with uh, introducing these interconnected streets and open spaces that then tie into the existing parkway and op natural open space characters. Next slide. So uh, the first area we talked about was the village center redevelopment. Uh, this is a copy of the board that we had at the open house. We had two approaches here. One was uh, showing limited change and then another was more uh, significant change. Um, we had a lot of input on these. A lot of input was related to maintaining a food presence, such as a, a grocery store. Um, you know, one of the concepts did not have the grocery. It assumed that you know, for some of the village centers that are near larger retail centers, it may not be feasible to have a grocery store. But there was a lot of interest in trying to maintain that or some kind of food or anchor presence. Um, there was also a lot of questions about building heights in comparison to the surrounding wanting to make sure we were respectful of those. So we go to the next plan. And the way we have this set up, we have, uh, we first have a, a, a plan diagram of the refined concept, and then uh, it switches. The plan diagram might stay the same, but we'll highlight different aspects of that plan. And then this will be followed by a, a three-dimensional perspective. Uh, the dark red represents new uh, redevelopment, uh, the lighter red, or salmon color is um, existing development. So here we're using Owen Brown as a, as an example. Um, again, this is not the plan for Owen Brown, but a potential opportunity. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, so one of the key principles with the village center uh, redevelopment is bringing open space to the forefront. 
a lot of the open space and village centers internalize. So if there is redevelopment, you know, looking for opportunities to bring that, make it more visible, make it more of a centerpiece. And in this case, a central green that ties into the naturalized open space that leads to the lakefront. Um, making sure open spaces and the connections are usable. Um, and then integrating as we integrate stormwater management and other environmental site design, integrating them into the open space as a design feature and not uh, just an engineering solution or a utilitarian solution. Um, is two is leveraging amenities. In the case of Owen Brown, uh, with this uh, wonderful lakefront with Lake Alcorn, uh, the pathway, um, and I, I, I shared in a previous meeting that uh, beautiful summer afternoon I was out here and the, the lakefront was just packed with people and families and strollers and bikers. And right at noon, I went up to get lunch at Owen Brown and the village center was pretty much empty. Um, and there's not a real strong connection between the two. So how do you, when you have a, a, a village center next to an amenity, how do you create the two? How do you uh, leverage your amenities? For example, Lake Elkhorn, uh, we got a lot of positive comment about putting a destination use or considering a destination use like a, a restaurant or some other uh, community function right on the water to provide eyes on that, take advantage of the lakefront and provide some opportunities there. Um, and then strengthening a connection back to the village center. Uh, creating a destination, uh, looking at, uh, you know, not just if we're introducing residential, not just looking at residential, but keeping a variety of uses, public art, cultural uses, community uses, being sensitive to context with building heights and transitioning to adjacency. Next. Um, and supporting transportation choices as we introduce new street networks, making sure they're complete streets that we're accommodating bicyclists, scooters, other forms of mobility than just the car. Um, they may, the streets may accommodate the car, but they accommodate pedestrians and other forms of mobility as well. Um, and then using um, um, uh, intuitive connections, really reinforcing so that when you're at an amenity like Lake Alcorn or some other um, open space uh, that there's very intuitive connections to the village center um, and uh, it leads you to destinations. The next. And then expanding the uses, introducing residential so that there uh, you can activate, um, have more of a 24 hour presence in the village center, but then being respectful that the whole village center is not converted to residential, maintaining some of the important aspects that are uh, common to them. The, the retail and support use, and, and ideally as much as possible, a grocery store or some kind of food or anchor presence um, as part of the mix. And then this is a sketch showing um, how that could, uh, an aerial view, looking to see how that might trans transpire on the site, the, the, in the housing that we've introduced, multifamily, similar to what we have at uh, Wild Lake is maybe a four story, uh, type of a product in the background is some of the existing the adjacent 10 story. I think it's about 10 story um, uh, building that's uh, existing. Um, and then as you get closer to the edges to existing neighborhoods trans uh, transitioning um, uh, to that in height and scale. Next slide. And then this is a close up down of that open space. So bringing that front and center. So it not only is a central focal point for the village center itself, but it has a strong presence on and visual presence um, from, uh, in this case, Cradle Rock Way and from the surrounding street network. And uh, in this case, looking at terraced stormwater management uh, and integrating that into a feature of this space. Uh, commercial corridors, uh, we've looked at two areas. Uh, we've looked at some smaller areas uh, for transformed activity. Uh, this was an area along Snowden River Parkway, uh, we showed a, a low density, moderate and uh, uh, a more intensive uh, redevelopment scheme. Uh, some of the concerns we input we got were concerns from detracting from the village centers um, and then putting more demands on the infrastructure with some of the higher densities. As we go to the next slide, um, we've really landed on, it was kind of more in that moderate range uh, from the impact we got. We were, showing some parking structures. And I think a lot of the input we got was uh, that was maybe too intensive, but what we're showing here is how um, 
and this happens to be where the Supreme Court is located. So should that ever redevelop, is there a way to redevelop that in a way that it uh, starts to make this more of a place and the uses relate to each other rather than just be surrounded by parking lots? Next slide. So uh, you know, creating a focal point, much like we did with the Village Center, you know, is there an amenity, an open space area that different uses, whether they're retail or something like the athletic center or some other civic use could uh, relate to and um, help activate. Um, and then uh, the facilities, the, the, the buildings relate to each other and relate to the streets where the public realm is and pedestrians will be walking. Next slide. Um, mixing and expanding the uses, uh, while this may be primarily commercial uses, providing some opportunities for some residential, and it might be upper floor residential, some of the missing middle, or some of the um, uh, office space introduced. Um, promoting a walkable public realm, so orienting buildings to the streets where they start to you know, provide more eyes on the street, help activate some of the retail, it can activate that pedestrian environment, but then also creating uh, better connections or more intuitive connections to the adjacent neighborhoods to these uh, places rather than just uh, creating buffers between the residential and the commercial area. Look at ways that the design can happen, that they can be connected to each other uh, from a pedestrian standpoint. And then supporting local transit and mobility options. So Snowden River Parkway is an ideal corridor that if they're uh, you know, depending on any kind of mobility options or transit that's incorporated, looking at how some of this development can be oriented around a potential transit stop uh, to support those. And then utilizing the, uh, in this case, the railroad uh, here, uh, the rail line to um, uh, create a greenway connection over to Gateway and over to Route 1. Next slide. And then uh, not forgetting that uh, uh, this is along a parkway, so wherever we can enhance this uh, parkway character where we have parking lots adjacent to the parkway or service areas, emphasize a heavy landscape treatment so they're screened and buffered like they typically are in Columbia, but where the architecture and buildings are located, bring them, uh, uh, have, let them have a presence onto the parkway that, uh, you know, emphasizing high design quality and that they can uh, help add to the character of the parkway with the landscape and not detract from it. And then planning for future build, uh, flexibility, locating buildings in a way that so surface parking, uh, there can maybe be some additional infill uh, occurring in the parking lots, um, but the site planning is done in a way that that can accommodate that or not, um, depending on uh, demands in the future or changes in other locations. And then this is a aerial perspective sketch showing what that looked like uh, Snowden River Parkway running from east and west um, across the sketch, but then showing you can get a sense of the, how uh, buildings are starting to orient around the activated open space and oriented to the streets with maybe some outdoor dining for some restaurant uses, and you're creating that really activated public realm. And then the second corridor redevelopment area we showed was a, a larger area in the Dobbin uh, Road area. We showed uh, three concepts, uh, so showing a limited change, a moderate change, and a significant change. Uh, a lot of comments we got here were a lot of positive feedback that mixing of uses and improving connections from, say, Dobbin area to the area to the south uh, would be an improvement to the area for you know those uh, working in this area or utilizing the services here. Again, concerned with impacts to infrastructure um, and some thoughts on, on the more intensive change, uh, a desire that most of the significant change should really be reserved for the gateway project. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so we landed on more of the, the middle approach where we're, um, we could go to the next slide, where we're being strategic with infill, we're not uh, we're not showing a replacement of any existing development. We're just infilling on existing surface parking lots, adding some structured parking, but which would allow some new uses, new buildings oriented to the street, allows the creation of some new open spaces as well. Um, and those uses oriented in a way that they're activating and leveraging the value of some of those open spaces and streets. Next. 
uh, extending the street network, uh, creating more internal connections, for example, from the Dobbin area at the top down to the employment area below so that you don't have to go out onto the collector road network to get from one to the other. And then certainly, uh, next slide, uh, creating smaller walkable blocks and then enhancing connections with the pedestrian network uh, from the natural uh, trail system off to the left on the other side of Dobbin Road, but having delivered connections to Dobbin Center um, and according to, uh, in implementing the recommendations of Bike Howard, Walk Howard with some pedestrian bridge crossings across Snowden River in 175. Um, and so providing options here and reducing the dependency on the automobile. Next slide. Um, and then introducing meaningful open spaces so that uh, each of these developments has some open. When I say meaningful, that uses face onto them, there's uses that activate them. These would be the places where you might have some retail uses and restaurants where people can spill out into the open space and they become the front doors for buildings or they uh, connect from one, uh, help connect development to the more natural open space systems. And they become destinations along the pathway and bikeway network. And the next slide uh, shows that in an aerial view. Uh, I think a good example is right in the foreground here, where we have the existing, the three building, three office buildings that are currently surrounded by parking, um, you know, introducing some buildings that connect them to the street and they might act, create a more active space that then ties into um, and makes more valuable that existing lake that's currently there. And then you can see how some of the other parking areas are translated into park spaces. So with that, we want to take a discussion break. We'll do, we have three discussion breaks. So our plan is to go through um, a couple of these areas and then um, have some discussion, have an opportunity to answer questions and uh, go forward. Thanks, Tom. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. My name is Mary Kendall, uh, also with the Department of Planning and Zoning. Um, so we're going to use this as an opportunity for you to ask some questions or make some comments. Uh, and what we're going to ask you to do is please use the raise hand icon uh, if you would like um, for us to call on you. Uh, the raise the hand icon if you're in the WebEx application that should be in the bottom right hand corner. If you open up the participant list, you should be able to see it. If you logged into WebEx using a web browser, uh, there should be three dots at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to click on those and within um, within the three dots is the, um, the hand icon for you to raise. Uh, and then finally, if you're having technical issues, uh, you can't find the raise hand icon, um, or you don't have a working microphone on your computer, please send us a message in the chat, just letting us know that you'd like us to call on you, that you have a question you'd like um, you'd like to ask. So we currently have uh, just about three people right now with their hands raised, um, and we have about a total of ten minutes or so to get through this uh, discussion question. All right, so let's start with uh, Ted Buxton. Sarah, would you unmute Ted, please? Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I was talking about the Dobbin Road uh, development, and I like the connection, the internal connection uh, with the Walmart area to the commercial area. That's that's excellent. So people don't have to go out onto uh, Dobbin Road again. But my question was related to uh, development of Dobbin Road itself, would there be a uh, expansion of Dobbin Road? So there's either two lanes or bike lanes or something, because if there's more development, then there's going to be more traffic and more transportation need on that road. Yeah, and I can respond to that. And I think that would, um, the, uh, I, I know uh, Bike Howard and Walk Howard have some additional uh, facilities planned along Dobbin Road in terms of bike and uh, pedestrian connections. Um, in terms of widening, I don't know if anything has uh, been planned at this point, but certainly that would need to be considered as you know, the area grows, uh, you know, those uh, considerations would need to be uh, taken into account. Um, you know, as, uh, as development occurs, it would need to be looked at a 
you know, a whole master plan level of, you know, what the new road connections are doing for you and then what impacts that has on the, the adjacent uh, streets. Thank you. Uh, and then after you've been called on, if you could please lower your hand. So you just click on the raise hand icon again to lower it. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up, Richard Bolton. And yeah. Richard Bolton. Hi. Uh, Hi. I like where you're going with this. Uh, it, it's really starting to shape up and it sounds like you've been listening uh, to uh, your customers here. I am concerned that at no point are we looking at a Columbia district. And Columbia uh, contains one third of the population of our county. We have historic districts. Uh, and Columbia is uh, recognized as a particular unique community, but uh, we haven't really roped off a geographic area uh, where these uh, these designs would apply. Now we have a design for uh, uh, the downtown area, uh, and we have a we should have a plan for all of Columbia. It should be specific to Columbia because we have some very unique uh, needs here. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Joel Hurwitz. Good evening, everybody. Um, the Owen Brown example. I guess when Ralph's design plan was to have the community center is supposed to also have the community things like the library and the fitness center and the school. So from an aerial, they're all together, but you don't get the sense when you go to the library that you're really at the village center. And by your idea of oriented to the lake, you seem to be turning the back on that. So how do you activate everything that way and since I'm on the Harper's Choice Board and hope to update our VCCP in the next several years, if you've done any uh, concept plans for Harper's Choice, I'd like to know if they could be shared sometime. For the same um, reasons of trying to activate more of the surrounding community and yeah, circulation um, patterns. Joel, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, when you say from an arrow, you're talking about the aerial sketch that we showed? Or were you saying it, it, as it currently Just exists? in general, from an aerial, aerial, if you look at it from the air, the, the library and the 50 plus and the school are all in the center of the community, but you're not really, you can't drive from one to the other, and you, so you're limited to walking and biking. So how do you... Uh, Make the village center connect to those uh, community uh, resources. Yeah, well, I think um, you know that's gonna you're gonna look at that on the, uh, each village center, and we only did the one plan for Owen Brown. We know over the years a lot of different concepts have been developed for different village centers, but for this effort, we just focused on Owen Brown as an example. But it's with the internal street networks. Um, some of the village centers might have some connecting streets to um, existing or adjacent facilities. We didn't. Sh we showed existing pathway connections for Owen Brown, but we didn't show any uh, new roadway connections other than internal to the Owen Brown Village Center. But um, I think you raise a good point that you want to have multiple ways of getting from uh, from these facilities to the village center and have it all feel like part of a greater whole and ideally that that those connections are more oriented to the pedestrian even if there is a roadway connection it's a very pedestrian friendly street um, and the new uses that are developed in the village center redevelopment are you know fronting onto those streets and helping to activate that connection thank you all right so we have about five minutes left for this portion of the discussion and i've got four people to call on um, like I said, if you end up having questions um, throughout the presentation, or if I don't, if we don't get to you, uh, we can certainly stick around after the meeting and continue answering questions. And there will be two more discussion breaks. Uh, so next is Lisa Dean. 
everybody. I appreciate. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate your work you're doing. Um, I want to amplify um, Mr. Bolton's comment about the concept of Columbia. Um, and I encourage you all to go back and um, look at the Columbia archives and the original and subsequent uh, welcome center videos that particularly talk about the importance of the village centers as being the heart and soul of our villages. And I'm concerned particularly about Hickory Ridge and um, the concept of having transformation in that area. Hickory Ridge is on the outskirts of Columbia. There are not currently high density um, developments near that area. And I'm concerned about plans that would um, overdevelop that area and uh, take out uh, the character of that area and make that uh, the, uh, future development not in keeping with the surrounding neighborhoods. So where I see your plans for Owen Brown um, as very dense, um, I would urge you all to really think about what is Columbia? What makes it special? What drew people here in the first place? And what makes it on the top lists of um, happiest places to live, best places to live? Um, and consider that people brought bought into Columbia um, expecting the covenants to be um, respected and enforced. And particularly at Hickory Ridge, there are covenants on the village center that prohibit um, uh, intense residential development. Um, so I ask that y'all uh, consider truly when you ask what makes Columbia special, what are the characteristics of Columbia, really go back and look at uh, how Columbia was founded, uh, why we bought into it, and uh, that will, I think, inform your development and your future planning. Thanks. Thanks. I, th I think that's some uh, a very good point, and uh, you know, I want to stress again that you know for the each village center is going to have their own unique needs, and you know Hickory Ridge, as you said, being a more on the edge and the outskirts of Columbia, will have uh, different characteristics and different uh, as it, you know, if there is redevelopment there or any transformation, it's going to be very different than what you might uh, achieve in an Owen Brown or a Wild Lake. Um, and so if there's residential introduced that maybe at a very different scale and not the same that you would do in some of these other um, uh, village centers. That's, uh, thank you. Thank you. Hey, we are only going to take 3 more people. If I don't get to you, then hopefully you can raise your hand in the next discussion period and we have until 650. so we don't have much time to get through these questions. Uh, next is Andrew white, then Jennifer Teresa and then Jervis Dorton. So, Andrew. Yeah. My, uh, in, in listening to you speak, you don't, the, uh, the importance of the village centers as retail locations, uh, especially, uh, I mean, I realize there have been really village centers for various reasons that haven't been successful, but for the ones that are successful, they appear to have, uh, Grocery stores of around 55,000 square feet, which appear to be the current size of grocery stores for an area like a village center would have. And I think it's important to not uh, sort of discount the importance of the grocery stores as a place to shop for groceries, because I use my village center fairly intensely. Uh, it has uh, automobile repair uh, and, and a lot of the other services, including uh, two sit down restaurants. It had at one time a total of four sit down, good sit down restaurants. It has two good sit down restaurants left at this time. And uh, currently they are, uh, one of them is carry out, but still it's there. Uh, and it's, a, it's one that I can drive to. Uh, and you're sort of discounting parking. Parking, I, th I think, is important for ease and convenience. That makes a village center a little bit more convenient, let's say, than going to a uh, store like Wegmans, where you have to go into a multi-tiered parking garage, which, which I find inconvenient. I don't use very often. I use my uh, uh, grocery store. The second thing is, 
if you start to downsize your grocery store footprints, then you're going to, you're starting to create what I think are uh, food deserts in Colombia. I mean, they bemoan the fact of food deserts in Baltimore uh, and not having uh, stores like we do in our village centers that are large. They're in a competitive marketplace, so they not, may not always be the cheapest place in town, but they are competitive in prices uh, and their, uh, their offerings. So I, I just uh, would say one is I think cars will be around for a while for the next uh, 20 years. There are other new concepts that may uh, come to the forefront, but uh, to start artificially limiting parking spaces or to start limiting parking spaces and throwing uh, parking into uh, residential neighborhoods uh, is is possibly a bad idea, and in one of your uh, presentations or, or things I've read, that was one of your uh, concepts. But so, uh, village centers are important from a retail standpoint and shouldn't be uh, downgraded. And secondly, having a viable grocery store uh, of around 55,000 square feet is important, and with a uh, village center that has uh, the ones who are successful have successful large grocery stores. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I want to maybe I said something that uh, uh, maybe I didn't say it the right way, but you know we're not saying take the grocery stores out. You know as much as possible, we agree. A village center with a grocery store is is very important, and that's the ideal. In reality, some village centers are located where a grocery store may not be feasible. Um, so it might have to go to a, you know, ideally then if a, a 55,000 square foot grocery store is not feasible, that then do you go to a smaller model or some other way to provide food and address some of the food desert. And we also think you know, the, you know, the, the heart and soul of the village center has to be, you know, some of the retail and the services um, and then as well as some of the civic and cultural uses that were incorporated in them, but introducing some residential uh, helps the viability of those uh, businesses survive. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think we ever proposed suggesting parking goes into the adjacent neighborhoods. So the village centers have to be able to self park, um, but we are showing um, into a parking structure. And I recognize, you know, your concern with that over surface parking. But the village center, all the uses there would have to park. And the, the plan we did for Owen Brown, it shows a combination of garage parking as well as uh, surface parking, as well as on street parking with some of the new internal street network. Thank you. Great, so we can only take um, a few more questions. So we really do wanna move on. We wanna try to make sure everyone gets out of here by 8 p.m. Uh, next, Jennifer Teresa. Yeah, hi, thank you for this presentation. I appreciate it. And before we go any further, I just wanna say, I'm not sure Owen Brown needs a lot more density either. So I don't wanna, leave that as a uh, own brown versus hickory ridge I, I agree with the statement that perhaps we don't need a lot more density in the village centers but i'm a little concerned um about two things that you said and one was about the commercial i don't understand the statement where fifty-five thousand square foot feet of grocery store wouldn't be feasible because there already exists so what would make them not feasible and in that light i didn't see in your picture of Owen Brown where that commercial would be. I saw a lot of residential, but I didn't see in the picture. So maybe I just missed it. And then the yeah, second go back, uh, Kristen, I can point out the, the aerial. Um... Uh, go to the, the aerial sketch. So go forward now. So, so the um... picture. where's the grocery store? So it's uh, uh, actually maybe go back one slide to the plan. Uh, Kristen, sorry. So this number five here, this uh, to the right, uh, there's a you see a, a large surface parking area off to the right, and then there's a the grocery oh. store. It's a smaller grocery store than what's there is located in this area. Um, it could be a larger one. This is showing a, a new one. The existing grocery store really backs onto the open space network and you're kind of, you know, the connection to the lake is a, a back door. 
so it's it's just showing that if it were redeveloped and, and yeah the, the grocery stores are successful now and hopefully they stay that way but some of the retail market studies that have been done some of the village centers that are closer to um other high performing uh grocery stores and retail uh, outlets you know that may not always be the case that they're going to be there so we're looking at options for if a change has to occur yeah, I, I would just say that over my time on the council, and I was on the council for 12 years, what we found was that the smaller grocery stores were very hard to maintain. But if you had a significant enough village a, a grocery store that could be maintained, so the tiny ones were not um, particularly viable. And then the other thing I was wondering was you said something about a presence onto Snowden. And I was wondering if you were talking about directly onto Snowden, because over the years that has been something people objected to a lot. They didn't want it to look like, you know, like a Ritchie Highway or something like that in terms of directly entering onto Snowden. Yeah, and I'm it, well, yes, that. uh, that's a good, clear, good comment. So it's not uh, suggesting access off of Snowden as much as, except maybe where some existing roadway access points exist, but it's having a like the open space or the amenity space, the gathering space has a visual presence off of Snowden. So okay. any bike or pedestrian path along Snowden would have a direct tie in and the space would be visible. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. And last comment or question for this discussion break, Jervis Dorton. Yes, thank you. I just have a couple of very quick questions. Uh, um, did you uh, try to get some input from the owners of property in Gateway? It's all, it's nice to have residents uh, of Columbia making comments on these plans, but it seems that um, even more important is to get owners in Gateway on board and what their thoughts are for redevelopment. And similarly, um, uh, did you do any market research as to what prospects might be considered in these redevelopment areas, or are we just going to wait that till some future time to see how realistic these are? Yeah, and I'll, I might let, well, first of all, we'll be talking about Gateway a little later on, but I know we know that ec economic development has had conversations with property owners, and Amy um, or Mary may be able to add more to that. But um, um, Matt, maybe you could talk about the role of the RC Alcos market study in this overall general plan. Who's another member of the consultant? And they did trends analysis for us and they were looking at uh, overall the big numbers that we've shared with you in the past um, in terms of growth targets and those kind of things. But also we've been asking them about viability of certain sites um, or in certain prototypes, I guess, so to speak. Um, so we've been getting a little bit of validation that way, but you know, most marketing firms will tell you, give me a specific site and I can give you a specific answer, right? So a lot of what we talk about in this I think that's happening to follow. Again, because these are just Concepts. We're trying more Matt, at the general plan and then something. Yeah, Matt, you have a bad connection. You're break. We're you're in and out, so we have a bad connection with you. Well, while Matt tries to reestablish his connection, I just wanted to make a a couple points about. Um, kind of the purpose of this tonight is really to talk about the design if these uses were to come here. So we've done um, about eight workshops with the community at large talking about um, activity centers um, of which the village centers and some of the other um, activity center areas that we're showing tonight were part of those discussions. Um, so at, that was the point where we were um, discussing with the community about um, introducing a mix of uses and maybe what the scale of those activity centers would look like. 
Tom with Mahan Reichel, he's his his role in all of this and and this meeting tonight is to really look at okay, so if these areas do develop into activity centers, what should that look like? If the uses were to come here, what are the design concepts around that so that we can start to inform either design guidelines or development standards in the zoning ordinance at that time. So in terms of market research and things like that, that's that's being done at a broader general plan level. Um, again, tonight is really about the design of some of these concepts. Thank you, Amy. Go ahead, Tom. Okay, so uh, if we go to the next slide, we can start. So um, the next, uh, we'll talk about the next series of focus areas. One of the areas we looked at was um, older apartment redevelopment. Um, we used, in this case, Harper's Forest. As an example, uh, again, uh, just want to emphasize, we're not saying Harper's Forest has to be redeveloped, but we used it as an example in this case study. Should it or any other older apartment uh, community redevelop, you know, what are some opportunities for how that does? And so, you know, we showed earlier some lower density schemes and then some moderate density schemes that had more connectivity to it. Um, a lot of the input that we had um, in July was there's a, a support for expanding and extending the natural open space into any any uh, redeveloped area. Um, there's a lot of concern with building heights and what the relationship was with the surrounding and the surrounding woodlands. And then uh, uh, rightfully so concerned with its placing any affordable housing. We go to the next slide. So we looked at, um, and so we have a refined plan looking at, uh, you know, should any older apartment complex redevelop, you know, how could, what are some uh, design principles to apply? Um, again, using Harper's Forest as an example, but not saying that particular development needs to redevelop. Um, so one is providing residential options, whereas you're trying to introduce a variety, not just, you know, if it's an apartment, not just having apartment or multifamily, but maybe introducing some townhouse or some missing middle duplex triplexes, um, the live workspace. So incorporate a variety of housing types. Next slide. Looking at uh, you know in sites that have a sloping topography, really utilizing that grade to minimize the impacts of parking on the site. So uh, you know similar to the Roslyn Rise development where. Maybe there's some parking introduced underneath the uh, one level of parking underneath the building, taking advantage of that grade to minimize the amount of parking out on the site, and then using the building itself to pick up grade change so that the building is designing to the site and you're not designing the site to fit a building meant for a flat site. Next slide. Um, introducing, uh, as we've talked about in some of the other focus areas, meaningful open spaces. Um, you know, a lot of the open spaces in Columbia are, or in, in any kind of a development are leftover spaces, what's not buildable. So it might be in a big green setback, um, might look nice, but it doesn't really have any usable benefit. So trying to incorporate village greens or places where people can gather and the community can come together, not just something that looks nice. Um, and then spaces where Buildings can uh, you know, front onto these streets, can front on them, so you have the eyes on the park. It becomes a safer open space environment. But then also looking at the opportunity for both passive and active recreation. Next slide. Um, and those transitions into the natural open space system. So um, in this example, we are showing how the, the natural open space corridor that's currently behind Arthur's Ford could extend into the site uh, right up to Little Patuxen Parkway, incorporating more um, stormwater management, some more biodiversity and beneficial landscapes, not just mowed lawn, but uh, pollinator gardens and other, you know, improving habitat. And that becomes an amenity feature for this development, in addition to the more maintained open spaces that we have um, in the center green. Next slide. Um, and then also looking at opportunities for green roofs as well. Um, and then making connections, looking at you, know, are there some additional roadway connections that make sense so that everything's not coming in and out of one entrance point, but do we connect to, um, you know, other roadways to reinforce connections, whether it's to 
the village center or um, uh, other uh, community amenities. Um, and then maintaining uh, sensitivity of context and looking at transitions of building height. So locating lower lower buildings uh, that you know match the the scale of some of the adjacent buildings, and then maybe taller buildings or more internal to the site or adjacent to to woodlands where they're not going to make as much of an impact um, to the surroundings. Next slide. And then this is in uh, aerial view. Down in the bottom left shows the kind of the view arrow, the direction you're looking, but you get a sense of the the village green. Some of the the we're showing four story, you know, multifamily in the back that's adjacent to the woodlands, and then some smaller, whether it's townhouse or missing middle triplex, that's uh, along the western perimeter that transitions to some of the adjacent development to the to the left. The next slide. And then a, a down on the ground view of this helps illustrate when I talk about a, a meaningful open spaces. So use is front onto it. The open space has street frontage, so it's very visible. There's always eyes on this space. And here you get a sense of the building heights being respectful to the, the adjacent woodland. I know one of the comments that we got a lot was, you know, the building shouldn't tower above the woodlands. Uh, the woodlands should still dominate. Um, other areas that we looked at were parking lot redevelopment, and we looked at two areas. Uh, this is an area, again, all of these are using specific areas as examples, but the concepts could apply elsewhere in Columbia or elsewhere in Howard County, like along Route 40 or along Route 1. But, uh, uh, for example, we we're showing this is the uh, area along uh, Broken Land Parkway um, at the intersection of uh, Cradle Rock Way some large office buildings that are surrounded by parking and so showing opportunities for infill some of the ideas that we comments that we heard uh, were there's a, a, a if people like the idea of creating a walkable internal street network um support uh, a lot of support for replacing surface parking lots with with actual usable elements whether they be a building use or uh, new open spaces um, and then supporting pro uh, options that minimize the need for short distance automobile trips. So that someone that worked here could walk somewhere nearby to grab a sandwich or lunch and not have to get in the car and drive somewhere. Um, you know, even though the Owen Brown Village Center is not far away, some people would walk, some people would bike. But, uh, you know, in response to one of those comments that we got earlier, the quotes that we showed, you know, being realistic and a lot of people still make that drive. So providing more options to minimize those short term trips. Um, some concerns we heard was you know, detracting from the village centers uh, or competing with the village centers and then um, doing infill, but not looking at it in context with some improved mobility options or transit options. We go to the next slide. Um, so we kind of modified the comment, uh, the, the concept we had for here made it less intense. Again, the dark red represents some new infill development. The lighter red is existing development. Next slide. Um, so introducing new uses. Uh, we're here we're showing some maybe smaller scale retail or service uses that could um, you know a coffee shop or a sandwich shop, a dry cleaner that could support some of the office workers here and maybe uh, upper floor residential. Uh, so some of that missing middle uh, elements and, uh, or it could be some live workspaces as well. Next slide. Um, and then locating the infill where it starts to uh, you know, connect near the intersections with, in this case, Broken Land Parkway. So you start to get a connection. The, uh, the development and the uses aren't isolated back in the center of the parcel, but they start to extend to the street and connect to the adjacent neighborhoods and development to promote more walkability and connected connectivity to the village center and neighborhoods. Um, especially if there's a transit corridor along here or some kind of mobility corridor, uh, locating some of these uses near where a stop might be to make those stops and stations more viable. Next. And then, uh, as we showed earlier, respecting the parkway character, you know, where there's parking or service uses, 
adjacent to the roadway, really emphasizing the landscape screening, but then where there's buildings closer to the road, um, you know, emphasizing a, a, a positive architectural character adjacent to streets. So both the landscape and the architecture becomes part of that parkway character. Um, you know, some of the comments that we heard the last time of the in one of the earlier meetings, I kept emphasizing the landscape quality of the parkways. And we had several comments from folks saying, you know, the parkways shouldn't just be all about landscape. There should be, you know, there can be positive architectural quality along there together. So the combination of those, if well done, could really enhance that experience. Next slide. Um, and then, of course, again, enhancing the public realm, creating an internal street network, Walkwell Street, but then any new open spaces. They're located in an area where the uses could front onto them and activate those spaces and where they, uh, in the next slide, uh, reinforcing connections to the existing uh, pathway network. So again, as you're you know, along the pathway network through the open spaces, that the, you know, this becomes all of a sudden a destination along that, uh, along that route. And you don't end up just in a parking lot somewhere, but you end up in a place. Next. Um, and then, of course, uh, looking at opportunities with, you know, by introducing maybe some structured parking um, in here where, you know, because of the slope and the grade here, you could introduce just one level of parking, uh, build it into the hillside and not make an impact along the roadway, but then open up some of the surface parking areas for some of these uses, but also some more stormwater management, some green infrastructure. Um, if these are buildings that have flat roofs, uh, integrating a green roof opportunities and looking for those opportunities. Next slide. Um, in, in this view where, you know, we're showing, I talked about rooftops, flat roofs. In this case, we're looking at, um, you know, some of this development, even though it's commercial space, it might be some retail, might have some residential above, but it's mostly commercial. It could take on the scale of the adjacent uh, uh, commercial that we or residential that we see across the street with the smaller building forms, the pitched roof. So, um, you know, so look being sensitive to that adjacent context transitioning to some of those adjacent uses. Of course, some of these could be developed with flat roofs and incorporate green roofs as well. But I think the, the massing and scale of the buildings is to be, uh, be sensitive to the context and not look like a commercial strip uh, development. Next slide. And then we also looked at as part of when we did the Dobbin plans, one of the, uh, the, the scheme that showed significant change. We jumped across the street and showed how some parking uh, lot infill could occur at um, like Columbia Crossing. Say if there was ever change and some of those big box retail uses had ever you know gone away and there's redevelopment there, how could you develop those parking lots? Um, so with that, uh, some of the comments we got, we liked uh, a lot of uh, likes for the creating a walkable internal street network, support for replacing parking lots with usable elements. Um, uh, again, as before, concern with detracting from village centers and making sure that these uses are designed with uh, any redevelopment is designed with uh, reinforcing other mobility options, whether it's bike or transit pathways. Can we go to the next slide. So this is an example. Again, this parking lot could be along Route 40. It could be along Route 1. We're just using Columbia Crossing as an example. Um, and you know, with the way retail is changing over the years, you know, you know, we see a lot of places. Some of these big box centers and traditional shopping centers, you know, are not become viable anymore. So if there is change, you know, what what are some opportunities for these parking lots? Next slide. Um, so, uh, you know, as we've been talking about everything else, start with the public realm network of walkable streets as well as usable open spaces. Uh, right now, the only open space associated with this parking lot is the, the steep hillside associated with the stormwater management. This with redevelopment is showing creating some usable open spaces, some flat area, flexible use area and recreation and having these connect to each other connecting the pathway network across the street over to Dobbin Road, you know, as part of the vision for um, in Bike Howard and Walk Howard with some bridges over these uh, uh, Route 175 and Snowden River Parkway. 
Next slide. Looking at um, you know accommodating infill, but doing it in a way where it uh, you know you're hiding the parking, you're wrapping parking, whether it's structured parking with higher density wrapped around it, or it could be surface parking with a lower density wrapped around it. The street and the public realm becomes what's visible, and the parking is located um, behind. Next slide. And then introducing mix of uses again, look at not just any a sole your use, but introducing some residential as well as retail, still accommodating the retail restaurant pad sites that we have out along the roadway, but they become more connected to this uh, mixed use development. It becomes more of a place rather than a use located in a big parking lot. Next slide. And then, of course, as with everything else, enhancing stormwater management, integrating it into the open space design, looking for opportunities for green roofs and, and green streets. Next slide. And then the, just a, the visual of what that could look like, showing some of the green roofs, showing the internal street wet network in the foreground, showing a large part usable park space that's associated with the more natural um, a drainage corridor, but it all ties together into the pathway network, active streets with restaurant uses uh, fronting onto that, as well as some of the other uses. So right. well, let's take an opportunity for some more discussion. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Again, just to remind everybody, um, if you are having a difficult time finding where the raise hand feature is, please just send me a message and say to tell me to um, just say call on me, please, so I know that you actually want to to share a comment. Um, so first, uh, April Battle. There. Yes. Yes. I just want to thank you all for um, you know giving us a chance uh, to speak. My only comment is. You know, the green um, spaces that you call unusable, those are actually great spaces for, you know, many re residents that have moved to Columbia. You know, one thing that we've seen is sometimes when you're, when we take down the trees to create walkable spaces and usable spaces, it really causes us to get rid of a lot of that uh, greenery. And I think it's something that we want to maintain, um, which is a lot of the, uh, the unusable green spaces. So that's that's my um, observation and comment. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's a very good point. So I was probably a little cavalier in saying unusable. And so what I, um, because obviously a lot of the green space has uh, wildlife and a natural systems habitat. It might be a steep wooded slope uh, that is not accessible for people, but it obviously has an environmental and habitat value. And so what we're trying to do is Provide some, you know, adjacent to those and connecting to some of those spaces, having, uh, when I say usable space, a place where activities could occur, whether it's passive or more active. Um, you know, there's a lot of very large setbacks uh, that are, you know, a berm setback and they're mowed lawn and they might look attractive, but it's, you know, a restaurant that's along there or near there, you really can't go out and engage in that space. So we're looking at how can you, wherever you have open space, you know, maximizing its usefulness, whether it's from an environmental standpoint or from a kind of a social and uh, gathering community standpoint. But I, I appreciate your question or comment. Thank you. Thank you. So we have about seven people with their hands up. We have uh, about 10 minutes to get through this discussion break. I'll try to get to everyone. Um, but if not, then there's a third discussion break on the horizon. And hopefully I can, if I don't get to you this time, I'll call on you then. Uh, so first up is Jennifer Teresa and then Jervis Dorton. So I think my hand was up from before. Oh, okay. I'm Great. I, I do have a question, but I'll wait till after the others go. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Jervis Thornton, then Jackie Eng. No, I, that is just left over from the previous discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Jackie Eng, then Paul Virchinsky. Okay, I may be left over, but it is it ties the two discussions together. Thank you. Um, I am a housing advocate, and I'm absolutely appreciate all the work that's been done and appreciate the conversations about open space, particularly about transportation. 
but I'm just wondering from a big picture, is there a um, difference, a complementariness, that's even a word, uh, about maintaining to today's character of our communities uh, with Rouse's original vision of equity, and I go back to the opening slide that talked about equity being a primary focus of the um, POCO by Design group, which I appreciate and certainly support. Um, Art, how do we go forward? What, what was your consideration in thinking about these things coming together? And how do we go forward recognizing uh, the need for maintaining character aesthetics and meeting the needs uh, regarding housing in the Columbia and our community? Yeah, great question. Well, I think from, you know, maintaining aesthetics and, you know, I've been trying to, you know, trying to emphasize where I can, you know, that being respectful of your know, transitions to existing neighborhoods. And, you know, it's important to emphasize, we're not saying, you know, redevelop and change all Columbia, you know, this plan record, you know, that most of Columbia is intact and the existing is protected, but where there are areas of redevelopment, that's where some change can be introduced, but it has to transition and be respectful and design character what's adjacent. So depending on where this redevelopment occurs and new housing, you know, in one area from another, it might transit have different transitions. It might take on a different architectural form or amassing to kind of be respectful of what's adjacent. Um, you know, in terms of you know equity and make, meeting the needs of the community, you're know, really trying to promote the connectivity. But the, the transportation becomes an important part that it's not all dependent on the automobile, that we're providing options, providing connections, making the open spaces more accessible from all of these, you know, anywhere there's new residential as well as to existing residential. Um, and then making sure that open spaces and community areas uh, that are accessible to all are incorporated with uh, all these redevelopment uh, areas. Um, and then uh, you know, while we didn't distinguish it and we didn't call out specific areas, but we're, uh, you know, emphasizing that there needs to be the variety of housing needs met that um, by introducing different housing types, some smaller formats, some of these residential above or missing middle options, you know, it helps with some of the affordability, providing some smaller options that are designed in character with what's surrounding, but, um, there's a smaller, more affordable option in the footprint. It might not be a full single family house, but the design of it might be a triplex or a duplex, as Matt has shared in some other examples, but it would look look like a design to look like a large single family house and it fits in with the character of the neighborhood. Uh, thank you. So we have four people left and a little less than five minutes. Uh, so first is Paul Burchinski and then Bill McCormick. Uh, yes, good evening. Uh, I was looking at your transformation and one of the things you want to get away from is surface parking lots. Uh, at least that's what appears to be going on. And I was curious as to why you haven't addressed Snowden River Park and Ride and Broken Land Park and Ride. Uh, both of those are probably owned by MDOT. Uh, the FHWA has encouraged air rights development. And it seems to me, if you're talking about redeveloping those areas, uh, you should be looking at air rights development. Uh, it's uh, development that is, uh, uh, you know, would, would enhance those areas instead of leaving a surface parking lot in. Uh, matter of fact, looking probably 40 years out, I think that US 29 will be decked between the downtown and Oakland Mills as an overbuild. That's being done in a number of areas throughout the country, uh, and it would uh, tie together East and West Columbia, which is currently uh, divided by the river I call US 29. Thank you. All right, thanks, Paul. I think that's a great comment. Yeah, the, the park and rides, and it's, you know, certainly these principles could apply there too. We had 
you know, the limited ability to just focus on a certain number of areas, but um, you're absolutely right. The parking rides provide some opportunities there, um, you know, rather than just being a surface parking lot. Thank you. All right, and three more. First, Bill McCormick, then Richard Bolton, then Ted Cochran. So, Bill? Th thank you. Concerning the older apartments, the Oakland Mills uh, Village Board put together the Village Center Community Plan. It's filed with planning and zoning, and it calls for redevelopment to create a full spectrum of housing in Oakland Mills. And to do that, Oakland Mills needs upscale owner-occupied housing. We already have too much affordable housing. We need to consider context look at the existing income range and create housing for missing income ranges. The five older villages have more than enough apartments. Look at the farm rates in the local elementary schools. The concentration of existing apartments has helped to create the high farm rates. The five older villages need owner-occupied upscale housing. We need to deconcentrate the farm rates both mathematically and geographically. If we don't use redevelopment to deconcentrate the farm rates, we have failed. Thank you. Right, thank you. And yes, any any apartment redevelopment really needs to consider what the what the unique circumstances are in that area. So the point I'll take them. Yeah. Uh, next, Richard Bolton. Uh, yes, I'm really concerned about preserving our parkways. Uh, you suggested here putting the quality architecture on it. Well, there's very little quality architecture in Howard County, so I'm kind of worried about where you're going to find that. Uh, we need to make sure we got some big setbacks on our parkways. We need to have landscape buffers. We need to limit access. We need to keep them parkways. And uh, I was looking at one of your maps uh, over near. Uh, uh, like Elkhorn, you've got, you put buildings right on the parkways. Uh, we've seen what happened on Snowden River Parkway where a, a 20 pump gas station went in about uh, less than 10 feet from the highway, from the parkway with no buffer at all. So we got to preserve those parkways. And I'm not seeing that in your plans. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, you know, we kind of, we got very different opinions on that um, in, in some of the comments that there's a lot of feeling from many participants that the parkways architecture can be part of the parkway quality. Um, but, you know, certainly understand the concerns with some of what's been developed along snow and, and, you know, this is where some design standards and guidelines come in place that you know, if there is a uh, architecture on the parkways, you know, it needs to be a quality development. Everyone's going to have a different opinion on what quality is, but some standards need to be set that, you know, how, how can they be a contributing, contributing to the positive character of the parkway rather than detracting from it. Thank you. Uh, and last comment or question from Ted Cochran. Yes, I have uh, two quick points. One of them was uh, very similar to Mr. Bolton's that the um, examples that you showed all of them or almost all of them punched new roads into the parkways, um, which isn't con that consistent with promoting uh, walkability and bikeability and, and the parkways as a resource. Um, I would suggest that Instead of roads, you do you use bike paths and and or multi-use paths. That especially since that will increase the traffic to the village centers. And the second similar point is um, on the infill uh, that you were suggesting. I don't. I'm, I'm not so sure that especially in Columbia we need a lot of uh, separate commercial centers uh, separate from the village centers. And again, if you increase the um, walkability and bikeability to those village centers and drive retail into the commercial centers, you can use that infill for residential purposes. Yeah, and so I think we weren't really showing, we were um, on the connections to the parkways and the schemes we showed, we were using um, uh, connections that already exist. We weren't adding any new connections and would certainly, you know, certainly support and encourage, you know, the fewer roadway connections to the parkways as possible. So. 
and they could be, but they could be increased pedestrian and bike connections. Um, in terms of the commercial centers, and you know, that's a comment we heard from a lot. And I think the feeling is that there's a lot of commercial property out there. And if it stays commercial, the idea is how do you make that more of a place rather than just commercial surrounded by parking? So trying to uh, you know, create activity centers versus just strip commercial. Thank you. Um, so if everybody who currently has their hand up, if you could please put it down, how you put it down is just find the hand icon and click on the hand icon again, uh, and then your hand will go down. Uh, thank you. So if you want to move on to the part three, Tom. Yes. So the next part is uh, really talk about gateway, uh, the, the employment center. So this was a concept uh, that we had in July and want to emphasize again that with gateway, um, we're really setting forth in the general plan more of a framework that could be a guide for the future master plan. We don't want to do anything in the general plan that will create, that will preclude good thinking as part of the master plan process because the details really need to be worked out and it needs a very thorough, detailed, extensive master planning process beyond which could be accomplished in the general plan. So we focus on a really a public realm fr uh, framework and uh, you know some of the input we got from our uh, discussions at Gateway was there was uh, a lot of support that if, if there was the place in Columbia for taller buildings and greater density, uh, this was the place, especially if it meant that building up and more dense uh, allowed for the creation of more open space. Um, there's support of mix of uses and support for continuation of um, allowable industrial warehouse uses. That was something that we did not have in our July plans and we got a lot of comments that we can't forget having uh, industrial um, and warehouse uses still as part of gateway. Um, and then there is a lot of input that with, you know, li while liking a lot of uh, o emphasis on open space and more open space, you know, it can't all just be maintained landscapes. We need to introduce some more wild and natural landscapes in addition to those that are maintained, not only from an environmental standpoint, but also from a the practicality of, you know, the expectations of maintenance um, for all of these landscapes. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so we've uh, updated this diagram and you can see that uh, you know, what we're emphasizing, all of the green here, these are streets, uh, tree-lined streets, they're walkable streets, um, existing parkway networks, um, and then both natural uh, kind of, uh, you know, hill, wooded hillsides and stream valley open spaces, as well as new usable open spaces and park spaces. And the idea is that create the uh, public realm network first, uh, off of which, uh, which guides where development occurs, rather than the public realm being the leftover space of what couldn't be developed. So the public realm becomes more intentional. So we go to the next slide. We'll walk through this in a series of slides and graphics. Um, so in, this is what I just hit. Is that the public realm network is a hierarchy of open spaces, both natural and more active, passive and active. Next slide. Um, and then zooming in, you could start to see where some of these spaces uh, uh, you know, the space to the right where the number one is, that's a, a kind of a wooded hillside that currently exists. But then as you move to the left, that open green space in the center of the plan is more of a flat area that could be redeveloped as a usable park space. And then there might even be active recreation fields that you see to the far left. And they're all connected to the sidewalk network along the parkways, as well as the more urbanized streets. Next slide. Um, and then an example, this was a sketch we had in July, but showing how uh, some of those intentional open spaces that are integrated into the development, that they become uh, village squares or town squares that are activated by the uses around them. Um, and they connect with pathways to the natural systems. Next slide. Uh, an interconnected street network. Uh, so you could kind of see the, the curvilinear roads in here as, that are heavily landscaped as the existing parkway network of Columbia Gateway Drive and Robert Fulton Drive. But off of that becomes a network of more of a gridded street network. And the re reason we're showing a, 
gridded street network as it follows some of the existing property lines, and I'll talk about that in a little later, but it also creates more, uh, promotes more walkability by dividing the site into walkable blocks. You'll see that some of these, we have some uh, very small block, well, smaller blocks, and then some very larger blocks. These aren't location specific. Um, you know, they, these could be mixed up any different way. It depends on what uses a developed there. More of an industrial warehouse site might have a larger block, but then a residential or an office or retail site uh, or civic site might have smaller blocks. Next slide. Um, planning for significant growth, as I said, uh, you know, this is the one area of Columbia that could really accommodate transformation and we've um, uh, or significant transformation and change. And this is, uh, we've heard that a lot in the comments. This is an example. These are showing a range of buildings. Some of these taller ones are in the 10 story range, but really uh, the plan should accommodate a variety of building heights and a variety of maximum heights, depending on what part of gateway it's located. And that would, you know, would really be determined and thought out through the master plan process. The idea is, you know, supporting a 24 hour uh, community. Next slide. Um, look, being uh, uh, sensitive to phase development, um, you know, gateway, there's already a lot of development there. Once some of it's uh, very viable and active and fairly new, other parts of it are older and obsolete, a lot of one story vacant properties. And so as redevelopment occurs, it needs to occur, you know, take into account existing property lines and um, uh, street networks. It's going to be phased over time. Uh, you can't just wipe it clean and start off from scratch with a, a, a roadway and open space network that doesn't relate to what's existing because uh, the change is going to occur incrementally. Next slide. Um, the green infrastructure network. Uh, this is a drawing. We'll talk about this a little later, showing like some potential industrial uses and how they could manifest themselves on the site. But a green infrastructure network could include a wide variety of things, not just the natural uh, stream corridors and open space corridors, but green streets, um, having intentional um, uh, stormwater management facilities that integrate with the uh, open space system and become an amenity and uh, pathways and boardwalks and engage with those. So people are exposed to those systems and they become very visible. Um, looking at not just maintained open spaces, but uh, beneficial landscapes, meadows and uh, pollinator areas and uh, woodlands, just in addition to some mowed lawn areas or active recreation. Looking at green roofs as well. Next slide. Um, some examples uh, when we talk about green, yeah, this is uh, the, the right is a green street. This is in a new uh, infill redevelopment in uh, Pittsburgh, part of Bakery Square. Uh, these are green streets, so the parking area is permeable paving, and then adjacent to that are some flow through planters that accommodate the runoff, but also it's, it's designed in that they're amenities for the streetscape as well. And the, the green infrastructure becomes a very visible. A uh, very visible signature of this development. Some of the examples to the left, the top left and bottom right slide image are from the Navy Yard in Philadelphia, showing how the pedestrian spaces and boardwalks engage with some of these uh, wetlands and stormwater management areas. And the same with the, the bottom left and top right images are from Eager Park, a project that we did in. Uh, at the Hopkins Hospital campus in East Baltimore, uh, the pathway systems cross and engage with the stormwater management areas that have uh, pollinating plants and so forth. So you can really engage with the natural systems. Next slide. Um, and then looking at uh, not only just uh, you know residential and commercial uses, but civic uses and community facilities as well. Gateway is an area where uh, it, you know really be a Kind of a self sustained community. So, an opportunity for a school site here, uh, cultural facilities, there might be libraries or other community uses, uh, rec active recreation fields incorporated into the development along with some of the higher intensity development. A higher intensity development could allow you to have more room for some of these other larger open spaces. Next slide. Um, introducing residential and provide housing options. Again, 
you know, a, a broad mix of housing, whether it's multifamily or townhouse, some of the missing middle, uh, but it might have a unique design signature here that uh, fits with the kind of the, the you know, high tech or the um, new technologies theme of gateway. And, you know, rather than, uh, you know, buffering residential from new industrial uses, that there might be a way that the and the residential uses are developed with an industrial theme and they're really integrated with some of the industrial uses um, and create a, you know, a more unique environment than what you might find elsewhere in Columbia. Next slide. Uh, showcasing industry here, we're showing, uh, you know, a variety of scales of industrial buildings, warehouse buildings. There might be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, uses in the top left of the sketch. Those are greenhouses. There might be a uh, agricultural related use uh, with green roofs and greenhouse uh, uh, agricultural uh, other warehouse uses. But, you know, again, having a strong architectural signature to these and integrating them into the pedestrian pathway system, not just develop like a typical industrial site. Next slide. Planning from mobility options, uh, transit corridors, uh, looking at the rail line to the south and the connection over to Route 1, but also looking at an internal bike and pedestrian network. We know the jogging trails and gateway are all very popular right now. But so, you know, building on that theme, if you go to the next slide, looking at opportunities for creating a grade separated pathway so that. While there'll be sidewalks and bike infrastructure along the roadways, creating a network that also uh, goes underneath roadways and you know, builds on the model of Columbia uh, that's already uh, been developed throughout Columbia of a grade separated bike paths and going under roadways and minimizing those barriers. And to the left is a diagram showing you know, the potential network throughout gateway of some of these grade separated bike and multi use pathways. Next slide. Um, and then showing how they, uh, you know, uh, can manifest, you know, both going back to streetscapes being one of the most important public realm elements from an earlier meeting, you know, these accommodate both bikes, pedestrians, scooters, might be golf carts, other forms of mobility. Next slide. Uh, and just some examples, we had these in the image boards at the July open house showing some examples of how some of this grade separation can occur and it, it doesn't have to be a, uh, just an engineered solution. It can become an amenity and a real attractor um, to the over the overall network. So it makes you want to, you know, go in the bridge over the highway versus it becoming a chore or something arduous. Next slide. Um, and showcasing innovative design, whether it's within industry and uh, how the uh, natural storm systems interface with the. Uh, uh, pedestrian areas. This is an example showing a, a a green stormwater management corridor that runs along this industrial warehouse development, but then showing uh, you know the connection from the parking lot has boardwalks and bridges over that outdoor amenity areas that engage with it, much like you saw in the example from um, the Navy Yard in Philadelphia. Um, it, but these you know make these intentional intentional and make them amenities versus just um, uh, you know, utilitarian feature. Next slide. Um, and then just examples of how uh, this was a, a, a stormwater system we did at part of Pierce's Park down at the Inner Harbor in Baltimore, but uh, it, it's really become an amenity that people can engage with and learn about the, the function of the rain garden. Um, and it becomes, it's really integrated into the overall landscape. It becomes an educational tool as well as a beneficial tool. Next slide. And so with that, we'll go into our last discussion break. Right, so right. 7.43, so in about 15 minutes. Yep. Uh, so uh, Hal Kassoff, your hands up. Yes, um, can you go back to the slide that shows mobility option plan view that includes the Maryland 175-108 intersection? Oh, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I forgot to point that out. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yes. So in today's, uh, yeah, right that's, there. that's it. Number two, the intersection of um, 
108 and 175 is adjacent to the red circle number two. That's an extremely busy intersection today. It works marginally well because it's a T intersection. It only has three legs. If you make it a four-way intersection and provide for all movements at that four-way intersection, the signal cycle will be lengthened. Uh, the number of signal phases will increase and the congestion will be untenable. Uh, this has already been studied by the Maryland State Highway Administration at the request of the county and uh, their report, which I have a copy of, uh, confirms that the congestion would be significantly higher. Gateway is uh, blessed with uh, what most developers would um, probably sell their youngest child for, and that is its own exclusive grade separated interchange, two exclusive lanes on 175 going eastbound, uh, excuse me, westbound. And there is enormous capacity for access into that area. Uh, if this intersection, which is a strategically important intersection for all of Columbia, it is the gateway intersection and serves the, not only the immediate land uses like the Costco uh, Gateway Shopping Center, Gateway Overlook, which has a huge amount of traffic, but serves uh, the heart of Columbia. Um, it will not only degrade uh, mobility for much of Columbia, but it'll degrade mobility for Gateway itself because you'll be pumping all of that traffic uh, through that intersection instead of the more circuitous but um, higher level of service uh, access through a great separated interchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I appreciate your comment, and we have you know heard some of those concerns before. I think the intention, and again, obviously those, the connectivity issue needs to be solved as part of the master plan process. And um, you know, the, we've heard in some of the conversations some opportunities to connect under 95 uh, to Mission Road over to Route 1, some other options there, a, a desire for the connection to 175, but recognizing there's a lot of concerns with that. So, you know, options for more connectivity need to be explored as part of the, um, the, master, uh, the master plan process. And thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Right. We have uh, five more people with their hands up. First is Bill McCormick, then Joel Hurwitz. Yes, thank you. Uh, some of your slides showed active recreation, open green spaces, which is excellent. America has an obesity crisis at all age levels. Where are we going to play? Over the last 50 years, Columbia Association has let a lot of the mowed open space go back to nature. That's fine for four-legged wildlife. What about two-legged wildlife? It's good to see that we are creating open space where multi-generations can congregate and play in active recreation. Thank you with two exclamation points. Thank you. Yeah, open space really needs to take on a variety of all forms. We, you know, when we, you know, we're, we're urban environments and so we can't just think of the wildlife, but we need to think of the human life as well in open space. So, but it needs to be a, a complementary, diverse package of all kinds of open space. Thanks. The next Joe Hurwitz and then Carol J. You'll be after Joel. Hi. So I just worry how you're going to one write some of these things and two so they actually have some meaning. That anything ever hap comes of this, it's not a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing. As I raised it, one of the earlier meetings, what became of all the redevelopment plans for Oakland Mills? As far as I know, nothing, because it's got too many owners. And Longreach redevelopment fell apart because the owners at the end refused to come to terms with the major developer. So Tom points out the problem, especially with Gateway, you're going to put the street 
where the current property owners are. Well, I just looked at the map. There are a huge number of property owners, and I think somebody else asked that question earlier, what they all think of this. So in what world do you take a existing complex and the owners go, I'd like to redevelop my little parcel, but I'm going to give up a lot of my acreage to put in a road for the county. And unless there's one master developer as we have downtown, how does this ever going to happen? Um, because you keep having what we have in the county is when anybody has a parcel, they do their own thing and we end up with pipe stems to get a lot of little houses with uh, very little frontage or you put in one little road with a cul-de-sac. And the same problem with the Harper's Forest example. Yes, that's a nice place in and of itself to redevelop. I looked at that for a while. It's got a lot of excess unused space, but its neighbors, as Bill McCormick says, are one of the most dense areas of Columbia, apparently from the 2010 census, the most non-white. So how do you balance that by not putting more concentrations of, of uh, farms problems, which we already have, or traffic, and the fact that Enterprise has got their little parcel next door, they've already got a plan to redevelop it. So how do you talk about what an old apartment complex is in the plan when it's a teeny little two acre lot versus a 12 acre lot that you actually can redevelop to do something with. And how do you integrate that into the greater community when, unless you have 12 acres, it doesn't make any sense because you're going to do your own thing. And it would have made more sense if you had a master developer for the whole area. So. Again, I don't know how you're going to write this to what it means anything. The same with the, the frontage on, uh, on broken land. They're trying to put in a, uh, I guess the Starbucks, it's under appeal from the development process rather than putting in houses and sorts of other things. So, well, well as you know, Matt had said I, I earlier, that. so that, you know, the general plan is, you know, one step in a process of, you know, documents and regulations and guidelines you know the general plan is setting the policies and then there's other steps after this to make it happen but i'll, I'll start where you started with gateway you know all, there, there's been a lot of discussion in gateway with property owner over the years and so again that's where the concept of the master plan comes in that you have to look at it from a master plan standpoint so that you can get a realistic approach for how it redevelops and not just leave it up to one individual property after another so that the master plan becomes part of that process thank you uh next we have carol j and then jenny thomas hello um i like columbia uh the way it was 30 years ago uh where the emphasis was on uh community i see with all the development that's going on uh, community is going away. Uh, uh, someone mentioned uh, the grocery stores. Uh, they're they're going away. Uh, my question is, why is there so much emphasis, in my eyes, for um, developing uh, more units in Colombia? Um, I see that uh, more units brings in uh, pollution. Um, I brought that up <clears throat> maybe 10 years ago, what was going to be done regarding the, uh, the traffic on 175. I know at one time I used to be able to sleep with my windows open. Now I can't because I'm breathing in uh, exhaust from 175. And um, I'm hearing the airplanes uh, take off and land uh, over my home. Uh, 
I see uh, trash uh, on the roadways. And I'm surprised that uh, Columbia uh, is still, I guess, uh, a city people want to move into, especially with the crime rate rising. Uh, how is this? Uh, I don't understand why more housing. Matt, do you want to talk about that maybe in the larger context of the, the general plan? Um, maybe just a few words. I mean, I appreciate everything you said. Um, and as part of that, I think what's really hard about the general plan is balance. Um, and it's very this this general plan is harder than anyone you've ever had to write before because you've run out of a lot of land. And so it's what's competing for the land. Um, or is that competition redevelopment? Is it infill development and the like? And, you know, we heard earlier in this evening's um, discussion about, you know, uh, advocacy for affordable housing, for example, where do you put it? Well, wherever you put it, then you have potential environmental impacts, transportation impacts, the like. Even if it goes there, does it even match character? Um, so it's, it's a very complicated uh, path that you go down with the general plan. And it's implementing tools, but um, I hear you and I, I sympathize with some of those concerns and that's what this whole plan's about is trying to balance all that out. So um, it's, it's not a, it's not an easy problem to solve, frankly. Uh, next, uh, Jenny Thomas and Ted Buxton and we're um, just let everybody know after we get through this discussion break, we do want to cover. Uh, next step. So we'll just need about five more minutes after your, of your time. Okay, I'll try and get this done in two minutes. Thank you, Ginny Thomas. Um, with Matt's comment about balance, I guess this is my question, and I apologize. I probably should know the answer. So again, I apologize in advance. But what you're promoting is, uh, I think there's only about two percent of undeveloped land left in the metropolitan district. I could be wrong. It could be a little bit higher. Um, but you're you're promoting really increased residential and commercial creative development in this presentation tonight, and you have a lot of innovative ideas here. Uh, but I want to know: Are you doing the same thing for Clarksville uh, districts like Clarksville, Fulton, Maple Lawn, and Highland is one. Savage, Jessup, North Laurel, and Route One is a second. Route 32, 70, and 144 West Friendship area, where you have all those highways, is another one. And Elkbridge and Route 1 is another district, and then Route 1 and the whole Ellicott City area is another one. Are you doing the same thing there where you're showing how um, your concepts could be applied? It's a good question. I'll, I'll start the answer if anybody wants to jump in. So the, the Newtown, Columbia, and even Route 1 areas are all having drawings done similar to what's been presented today. Uh, but to steal from my, my kids' homework assignment, we're using the transfer transformative property uh, to try to show how some of these lessons learned can be applied elsewhere within the county. But just resources and everything, what they were, we couldn't kind of draw everywhere within the county. But we did, um, one of the challenges that we were given was to try to give some clarity for when you get to the new town zoning discussion during the comprehensive rezoning process. And then how to integrate in the route 1, um, corridor master plan that was going on. And the, so that's why they were specifically challenges for us to get some drawings in for that, that reason. But as Tom was showing, a lot of these lessons learned can be transferred to other places and we'll kind of make those connections a little bit, but they won't have the same number of drawings, um, like you see for these areas. Uh, three more just to be, yeah, just to be um, clear that and there are other activity centers that are being proposed in many of the areas that you mentioned, such as route 40, various areas in route 1. Um, so, just because there aren't this, th there wasn't this level of detail. Um, there are still areas that are identified similarly throughout the county. Just without the design um, context to them. Correct. Right. And three more people have their hands up. So first Ted Buxton, then Jennifer Teresa, then Clara Fitzgerald. 
Dr. Ted. Okay. Um, Columbia was developed, as you know, by Rouse to achieve integration, racial and economic integration. And doing that, uh, we have a, um, a variety of housing options in the county. Uh, I mean, in the sit in the Columbia. My question is, what can Howard County do to ensure the diversity of the population and of the housing mix when redevelopment occurs? Uh, so that we don't end up with places like uh, that are concentrated with certain types of economic uh, uh, backgrounds or housing. Does that make sense? What what can Howard County do? Uh, does that have any leverage or? I'll I'll give a I want to give a short answer um, and then if others want to jump in but uh, what you described is is a lot of the problem when when the developer wants to do it it tends to happen right when the government creates the rules and regulations to do it it's either an incentive like a can I get you to do it or it's some type of a requirement but the requirement is always a little different or maybe applies differently or maybe um, you know just has an application flaw sometimes. So the best situation is when the actual developer wants to do it on their own. Uh, there are some rules and policies and funds you can put in, in play that would incentivize that kind of stuff. But again, it's all about roles and responsibilities and where the government is versus the developer in the Columbia example. And so we're gonna think through some of those things, but you know, again, it's about their effectiveness, right? And that's what we'll be measured by. Uh, thank you. Next, uh, Jennifer Teresa. Okay, well, not what I raised my hand for, but to the last two callers point, uh, not callers, but speakers points. I mean, you're, you're, I guess, proposing to open up Columbia to additional density. And that is when you really need to figure out how to put those controls. Um, those controls into the whole process. And if you can't figure that out, I guess my suggestion would be don't open that Pandora's box. I, it, and I think to um, Ginny's point, are you talking about this densification in other areas? Because Columbia is built out in terms of its density. So the question is, are we look, why look at the most dense part of the county, the most diverse part of the county? for that additional density. And that that's one question and I don't know if you want me to tell you the other quickly. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just respond very quickly to yeah. that comment or question. Um, we're looking at activity centers throughout the county. Um, just because we drew these was because of the attention for the reason I described earlier about the new town zoning and those kind of things. Um, mm -hmm. But working with the planning advisory committee that we had um, formed over the summer, we worked on the future land use map and uh, they identified with us uh, opportunities for activity centers on Route 40, on Route 1, Snowden Dobbin Road, um, the transit activity centers on the Camden line, um, downtown Columbia it has its uh, master plan. Gateway is really what they called the last frontier, as well as the village centers were identified, as well as even some of the um, rural crossroads that are out west as opportunities too. So, no, we've been looking all over the county. It's just, um, we got into more detail here than we did anywhere else. And that's why the presentation is really focused on, on that geography for this evening. No, 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 and I appreciate the, the presentation and the design of that. Um, but just in terms of looking at the density elsewhere where it's not already as dense as it is in Columbia. But really quickly, um, I just wanted to mention because I saw that you were suggesting building on the parking across from at Lake Elkhorn. And um, I wanted to point out that that's often used for activities at, for parking during activities at Lake Elkhorn. And I just want to make sure that you're keeping that in mind. Where will people park for those activities at Lake Elkhorn? Um, it is if you're looking from the street all the way to the left and I saw that you built, I, I don't know whether that was housing. I'm guessing it was housing, but I don't know if it was housing or commercial in your picture, but that's one thing. Um, the other thing is I noted it when you started this third part of your presentation, something said BRT on, was that on Snowden or on 
Robert Fulton Drive, it was in the top left. I think it was your first slide in this presentation. It said possible BRT. And it was in the top left corner of your, maybe the first slide. And I didn't know if you were talking about BRT on Snowden or BRT on Top left slide of first slide of gateway. Potential BRT. Oh, yeah. So that was from uh, the board in July. And it's really, yeah, you know, we've expanded that conversation to, um, you know, mobility corridor. It might be BRT bus rapid transit. It might be. What is that on uh, Snowden? Um, well, one, uh, you know, as lines were looked at or routes were looked at, some of it used part of Snowden. Um, and then would tie in, you know, cut across office node and somewhere into the gateway area. Okay. Uh, that were some studies for that, but it's it's really kind of not being specific with the BRT, but jumping back to more of a mobility okay. corridor. And then the final question I had was just about the open space and who you anticipated owning and operating that. Would that be Breck and Parks or how did you see it, that open it, space? It could be a combination. There could be some formal, you know, official park space introduced into there that you know, with some soccer fields or whatever that's under the jurisdiction of rec and parks. There might be some that's in Columbia Association. There might be some that are, you know, privately, it's publicly accessible, but it might be privately controlled. So, I, you know, we haven't, you know, we're not at a general plan level working out those details, but, you know, things like that, conversations like that would certainly occur during the um, master plan for gateway. I think that's a great question. Okay, thank you. And last just, year, we are I just wanted to mention something with the um, comment on the densification. Um, so the, you know, with the village centers particularly, and what we haven't really shown is um, the current land use map that we're operating under. Um, and then the future, do we have that in this and the future land use map? Um, because when you look at the two side by side, the current plan, Howard 2030, and then the proposed HOCO by design land use map, the areas that were that where we're showing, um, activity centers and growth areas are. For the most part, the same as areas that are already identified with policies, um, as such in the current general plan, the difference with HOCO by design is where specifying more targeted areas. So rather than identifying large swaths of the county as the entire Route 1 corridor, as let's say as a growth and revitalization area, we're trying to target various nodes, whether it's along Snowden, whether it's along Route 1. The village centers have always been, or for the last 10 years, have been a growth and revitalization area. In HOCO by design, we're setting the policy direction and we're really just maintaining consistency with, with the current general plan with that with that regard we're not changing the zoning at this point in time so we're not densifying the village centers so i just want unfortunately i think we didn't get a chance to explain that in this particular presentation but that's been part of the workshop series uh and i guess we have uh two more hands raised but uh, clara fitzgerald and then lada I just noting that many of your sketches for open space, usable open space seems to assume that must be flat. Uh, you did speak a little bit about terracing and about using step buildings and using mixed and separated grade intersections, but the open space itself, it, you seem to be assuming needs to be flat to be usable. I maybe no, no. another walk around Lake Elkhorn. Yeah, no, not not at all. So I, I, I guess when I the one example I pointed out where, you know, saying it's flatter is that particular example I pointed to, the wooded area that exists now is on a very steep slope, and then I was saying, you could add new open space adjacent to that, but that's flatter that you could have some more activity like a yeah you know, whether it's informal pickup games, ball games, or whatever, or some festivals or gatherings, that that would be flatter land. But certainly, uh, you know, the, the richness of the open space system is the variety and types of open spaces as well as the terrain. Uh, just that, the, you know, different terrains would allow different types of activities. 
Um, and then just uh, quickly, if I could just follow up on what Amy had said, um, as part of this particular workshop series, um, this is focused on the Newtown Columbia community, but if you want to uh, hear what the draft policy statements are um, for the rest of the county, all of those meetings, we held um, many of those we held virtually and they've all been recorded and they're posted on our website. So I do encourage you to go and uh, view some of those, those discussions or those uh, presentations that were held. Uh, and last comment from Lada. Um, so it seems to me that the biggest problem facing Columbia uh, these days is the schools that are bursting at the seams and the lack of space to build the, the badly needed uh, schools. So if you're really going to redevelop all of Gateway and you really can get all those uh, owners to agree to this, uh, as, as Joel pointed out, um, why not use Gateway for schools and recreation space? And that way you're at least helping a little bit to um, uh, ameliorate the issue. And, and especially since you're talking about adding residential um, in already crowded areas. Yeah, that's a great point. And we did, and maybe I glossed over that quickly, but we are showing school sites and uh, recreation field sites in, in the gateway as part of the master plan. All right, thank you. Matt, do you wanna wrap us up? Yeah, just really quickly. Thank you all very much for your time. Always learn something when we have a meeting. This is great. I just didn't want to leave you wondering where do we go next? So we just wanted to give a really quick overview of the next steps as we see them going forward. So right now we are writing the first draft of the general plan. Um, the consultant will turn it over um, to DPZ staff and then we'll work collaboratively on it uh, over the next couple of months. Ultimately, we'll be releasing a draft document out for public comment and the drawings and the things that you saw in here today will be in there as well. As well as the recommendations that you saw on the slides Tom presented will be with the drawings and so they'll be part of the general plan. We then will have a work session with the planning board in order to present the document to them um, for initial conversations. Then we plan to revise the document again before we go back for the planning board public hearing. And then we hope early in 2022 to be able to pre-file and start the process with county council. So the finish line, there actually is a finish line and it's, it's in sight if you squint far enough, um, but there's a thousand things to do between now and then and a, and a lot of opportunities for us still to interact. So please stay tuned. If you go to the next slide, uh, if you're not already, um, if you want to go to our project website, hokobydesign.com, it's the easiest way to know what's going on in the project. Anything that we create or produce, we put up there for download and review. And you'll notice in the right-hand corner, there's a register button. If you're interested and you click on the register button, then you can get the email updates that we send out um, so that you're definitely in the know of what's going on at each step in the process from now to adoption. Um, so again, I just encourage you to use the website if you want to kind of know what's going on right now. But if you can please register, we can make sure that you get the email so you're ready to go for our next meeting, event, survey, whatever it is. So with that, I thank you very much for your time and look forward to speaking with you all from here until adoption. Thank you all very much.